First of all, Tara Flood. Tara is a veterans disabled people's rights campaigner. She went to New York in 2006 as a representative of the inclusive education movement to take part in the work that went on between the international uh, deaf and disabled people's organizations to agree the wording of the convention. Tara, are you with us? I am, I'm just starting my video. Brilliant, um, great hi, to see Mom. you. So not... the first, sorry, the first question for you, why was the convention necessary? Okay, can I just say, oh, I'm not sure I love being described as a veteran. Uh, I've been around for a long time. I'm not sure I'm a veteran just yet. I don't know what, how that defines me, but anyway. Um, yeah, so yeah, why was the convention necessary? Well, I guess the, the very short answer is because until the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, we were essentially an invisible community. But I thought, uh, and we've also waited a very long time, more than 40 years. So I thought what I would do uh, to start answering the question is like just give us a little sort of stroll through the history of, of what we've had to endure uh, before we finally got our own convention. So if, if those of you who were born before 1981, you might remember that 1981 was the International Year of the Disabled, their description, not ours. And it was it, what was interesting about it is that it was a United Nations attempt to try to quieten down the growing call for a uh, convention uh, dedicated uh, to disabled people. So instead, they offered uh, a decade of disabled persons, and that was from 1983 to 1992. But that, again, as with the U as the international year, was dominated by the big disability charities and NGOs around the world. There was very little um, action led by disabled people because um, it was so much controlled by, by disability charities, apart from that moment where uh, Disabled People's International was formed. So after the decade, there was a world program of action uh, that came out in 1982. Uh, I think uh, the short, uh, short version of that is a world program of inaction. That was followed by the standard rules on the equalization of opportunities for persons with disabilities. That was published in 1994. Despite decades of campaigning and activism, we had to wait another 12 years for the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was agreed, as we all know, in 2006. And it could be say that um, good things happen to those that wait, but really that is a very long time to have to have wait, waited. And what's interesting, that the convention came 14 years after the General Secretary of the UN had declared um, the situation of disabled people around the world as a silent emergency. He just didn't think that there was any rush in doing anything about it. So yeah, the convention was really necessary and continues to be necessary. And so why? So the United Nations on the Convention on the Rights of uh, Persons with Disabilities is an international treaty which for the first time identifies the rights of disabled people and deaf people as well as the obligations on governments to promote, protect and ensure those rights. The convention has 50 articles and it covers most aspects of our lives, including, let's say, the rights of life, uh, the right to an education that's inclusive, the right to independent living, employment and adequate standard of living, access to justice, freedom of information and expression, as well as the right for DPOs, DDPOs to be involved in the monitoring of the implementation of the convention. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all 50. The convention is necessary because it shifts the narrative about who we are as deaf and disabled people, shifting away from that age old traditional um, approach of uh, us being seen as obje objects of charity, medical treatment and social protection, and much more towards seeing us as uh, human beings with rights who are capable of claiming those rights and making decisions about our lives, as well as being active members of society. The convention is intended as a human rights instrument with explicit social and development dimensions. It has a broad definition of, um, disabled, of disability, loosely based on the social model of disability, not as close as we would like to have been, but hey, 
uh, and it reaffirms that all deaf and disabled people must enjoy all human rights and fundamental freedoms. It also clarifies uh, and quantifies how, how all, cal uh, all categories of rights apply to deaf and disabled people and identifies the different areas where changes have to be made um, so that deaf and disabled people can effectively exercise our rights and areas where our rights have been violated and where protections of rights must be enforced. We'll hear, hear more about that later, I'm sure. Um, the CRPD is also important because it's pioneering. Um, it's the first human rights convention of the 21st century uh, to address disability rights on a worldwide scale. It was also the first convention of the 21st century that actively involved civil society in its creation. So many of the governments that were represented in New York during the convention discussions included disabled people in their delegation. And there were a few of us, um, I was there, uh, who were able to get to, the, um, to New York during those early discussions. And I think we were really effective in influencing both the definition, the, no one was talking about a social model definition, uh, definition before, um, before we started to push for it, but also some of the key articles within the convention, Article 19, 24, 33, etc. And then lastly on this question, You'll be pleased to know, Martha. Um, the convention, I think, is necessary because it creates a legally binding international instrument that exists to guarantee those states and governments who, who governments who ratify the treaty, who ratify the convention, that they have to promote and protect disabled and deaf people's rights. So, when a government ratifies a UN human rights treaty, it agrees to be bound by the obligations within that treaty, and that includes agreeing. Uh, and I guess that's what today's about. Um, it agrees to be monitored uh, by its implementation of the convention by the convention committee. And that's crucial because that's the opportunity to tell the world what's going on and what the real situation is for disabled people. That's a fantastic history. Thanks so much, Tara. Um, the next question for you, what's the relationship between the UN Convention and activism? Okay, these are such massive questions. They really are. <laughs> okay, so I, I think really um, the, the most important thing to remember uh, about the UNCRPD is that it only exists because of 40 years of activism by deaf and disabled people around the world. That campaigning has been driven by our refusal to continue to be defined in international law by the category of and others, as, we, as is the case with, I think, almost all other human rights treaties before the UNCRPD. That's important and that's because deaf and disabled people's activism. I think that othering, that invisibility um, left unchallenged for decades uh, led to discrimination, marginalization and systematic abuse of our rights for the last forever. So I talked earlier before I talked before about the convention being the first human rights treaty uh, to involve um, civil society, us, and that many governments represented the convention discussions, included disabled people in our in those delegations. Um, and it was the leading on from that it was activism again here in the uk that, that guaranteed the uk to be one of the first countries uh, to sign up to the convention that was in june 2009 but i need to say that's not because the government at the time was some fantastic champion for our human rights i think it was because disabled and deaf people at the time put a huge amount of pressure on the then labor government to follow up their commitment by actions. And I think, weirdly, there was still quite a good relationship between DDPOs and the Office for Disability Issues at the time. Remember, this was a Labour government, and that feels, I have to say, I'm sure for all of us, a very long time, a very long time ago. But I think when a state ratifies, when a government ratifies a treaty, it takes on legal obligations under international law. So as well as signing up to the CRPD, the UK government also signed up to the optional protocol. And you're going to hear more about that from other speakers. But that is essentially a complaints procedure that can be activated by civil society, again, by us. And I honestly think um, when 
governments, when states' parties sign optional protocols, they honestly think that no one's actually going to pursue them and how wrong they were when it came to the UK. The UK and the convention, I was thinking about this the other day, I think things feel so difficult at the moment that the UN convention feels like a very long way from the discrimination and the marginalisation and the oppression disabled people disabled people and deaf people are feeling every single day, but we shouldn't forget that we've been able to use the convention here in the UK. There have been numerous legal cases taken by deaf and disabled people since the convention was ratified. Um, we've been able to reference the convention as well as specific articles and the related general comments. Just general comments, I don't know if anyone's going to talk about general comments, but general comments are produced by the United Nations um, as a way of giving more information to governments and states parties for how they can implement particular articles. But in terms of the optional protocol, I don't think it's any surprise that it was down to disabled, deaf and disabled people's activism, again, led by DPAC, that triggered the optional protocol here in 2013, which led to the committee's inquiry. And as we know, it was an inquiry that found the UK government guilty of grave and systemic human rights abuses against disabled people. I think what's interesting, and it's, it's shameful for a country rich as rich as the UK, but we were the first of all the signatories of the convention to be subjected to an optional protocol inquiry, despite the government that say, saying how fantastic the law is for disabled people and deaf people and how supportive that they are. But that shameful position, that shining a bright light on the UK government's absolutely appalling treatment of disabled people came, again, came about again because of the power of activism. And in 2017, disability rights activists led the work to producing the, the first civil society report as part of the official scrutiny process. And it's also important to know that most of the disabled people in Geneva, deaf and disabled people in Geneva in 2017, giving evidence to the CRPD committee um, were activists. But there's more work to be done. Of course there is. Um, when the UK ratified the convention in 2009, it didn't make it part of our domestic law. And it shamefully, again, um, withdrew its ratification in relation to certain articles. called They're called caveats. And they remain for Article 27 and Article 24, Inclusive Education. So the activism needs to continue. But I just want to remind us again that the convention wouldn't have happened without deaf and disabled people's activism and full implementation of our rights will only happen with our activism now and into the future. So I'll stop there, Martha. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Tara.